Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is, of course, an honor and a privilege to have you as every day joining me today. I believe today is American Thanksgiving. I always get confused. Literally, I always ask my wife and my friends like 18 times in November, when's Thanksgiving again? When's Thanksgiving again? Because Canadian Thanksgiving, the real Thanksgiving, the Canadian Thanksgiving is actually in October, so I've already had my turkey day. But uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of my American friends who are watching this. Hope you have a great, relaxing, wonderful day. Maybe watch a little bit of football. Go see a movie. Heaven knows there's a couple movies out there that could use your help at the moment. And I'm just hoping you guys are all having a fantastic day. Okay, here's how today's show is going to go. As always, I've got five topics picked out that you guys have emailed in to me. And how do you get a topic or a question on the John Campus Show? It's really quite simple. You just email me anytime at john at thejohncampiashow.com and make sure you put that word topic in the subject line or else I won't get it. And also, so make sure you keep your emails to 90 words or less. <clears throat> Let me throw this in there too, guys. You want to radically increase your chances of getting a question on the John Caffia show? Don't ask me something about the DCEU. I kid you not. I put out a tweet about this the other day. And it's fine. I mean, the DCEU, Justice League, it's the biggest issue in the world of movies right now. Absolutely no doubt. So clearly, we got to talk about it and all the different things that come up. But I kid you not, literally out of like the last 500 emails I've gotten over the last couple of days, at least 470 of them have been about Justice League and the DCU and what the DCU should do now and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to radically increase your chances of getting a question on the show, write to me about something other than the DCU. But there is some really big DCU stuff to talk about. We will get to that. And also... At the end of the show, or near the end of the show, for those of you guys who are watching live, because a lot of you guys watch live, I'm going to be reserving some time to take your live questions. The way you can get a live topic, opinion, or question on the show, make sure you're following me on Twitter, at John Campia, and simply tweet to me, at John Campia. Just start your tweet with at John Campia, and maybe you will see your tweet here on the bottom of the screen. I'll go through as many of those as I possibly can. All right. Now, with all of those out of the way, let me just pull my stuff together here. With all of those out of the way, it's time for me to get on to the real meat and potatoes of today's show, which is the topics you guys have sent in to me. And we start off with topic number one, which comes to us from Gary. And Gary writes, I saw a preview for the upcoming season of Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and it appears the majority of it will take place in space. Immediately when I saw this, I thought, oh no, because this could so go south and downhill quickly. But I want to know your thoughts and opinions. All right, thanks a lot for the uh, question, man. And everybody knows I am a, I'm a big Marvel fan. I, I love the Marvel movies, with a couple of exceptions. Um, I'm mixed, though, on Marvel's television offerings. For example, Punisher's out right now. Punisher's awesome. Uh, Daredevil, for example. Daredevil's awesome. So they have Marvel has some stuff out there that's really, really good on television. And then, in my opinion, and you know, it's all subjective, but in my opinion, they also have some stuff that's not so good. Iron Fist, Inhumans, and these guys. I, I, I Look, I was so excited about Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. when it got started. And one of the, like, a couple of people are great in that show. This guy, Clark Gregg, amazing in that show. He's fantastic in it. Ming-Na is fabulous in that show. Whenever either of those two are on screen, I'm hooked, I'm addicted. But overall, I just feel like it's a mess of a show. They did some really cool things with Ghost Rider, but too little, too late, and not enough of it, and then they pop him back in once or twice. It, it just, I, I feel like they did. And then this whole thing at the end of last season, where they wake up and they're in outer space, and now it's going to be the space adventure, adventures of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You're right, it looks kind of lame. However, let's not jump to those conclusions. We can say it looks lame, and I think it looks lame, but I'm saying it looks lame, understanding that there have been a number of things that come out that look like they could be lame, but they actually end up being fantastic. And I think Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., maybe it does that. Now, of course, the first thought I have is also the first thought I'm sure a lot of you guys had, which is, wait a minute, we got Guardians of the Galaxy in outer space, Thor, Ragnarok all took place in outer space, Infinity War, we know there's going to be some of it taking place in outer space. Is this Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s way of backdooring a way to kind of show that they're connected to the MCU? Is, which is one of my big criticisms. Because if you watch Punisher, I don't think there's a single reference to the MCU in the entire season of Punisher. 
Uh, I could be wrong about that. Correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I believe there wasn't even a single reference. Whereas Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is like, every other word is blah, 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 Iron Man, blah, 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 Thor, blah, 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 Sokovia Accords, blah, blah, blah. Look, guys, we're part of the MCU. See? See? It's, it feels kind of desperate, but whatever. Um, and I know there's a lot of you guys out there who love Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and that's great. I still watch it even though I don't like it. Why do I do that to myself? Because I'm a sucker for comic book material. So I watch it, and uh, I'll watch it when it comes back. And yeah, on the surface, it looks like it could be pretty lame, but to be honest, you know, maybe it's the seeds of a really good idea. So let's not jump to conclusions. It's fine. Say what you think it looks like. It looks good. It looks poor. I think it looks poor. But I'm open to the possibility that it could be something really cool and really special, much like what they did with their uh, uh, Ghost Rider stuff. I thought the stuff they did with Ghost Rider was really quite good. And it was a different take on the mythology of it a little bit. They went in a little bit different direction than the traditional one that you thought they would have gone with. And, it, you know, that part of it worked. So maybe this part of it will work too. Let's keep our minds open. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Sharif Snugs. And Sharif Snugs writes, Since you've seen Coco, do you think Coco will have the highest opening at the box office for a Thanksgiving release date? Currently... The Hunger Games Catching Fire is number one at the box office, I mean, as far as opening on uh, Thanksgiving Day weekends, with 109 millions. Can Coco take that title? And yeah, Coco is in theaters right now. You guys can go to your theaters and see Coco, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. I loved this film, and I had my doubts. I had my doubts about Coco. I didn't think the trailers were spectacular, to be honest. I thought they were okay, but this is one of those situations where you watch the movie and you go, oh yeah, this is a difficult movie to market. Like how, how do you make a good tra like a really good trailer out of this without giving too much away or anything like that? And it, it would have been a monumental task. And I think the trailers have been as good as they can be. But trust me when I tell you, the trailers are not anywhere near as good as the movie itself. This movie is a triumph. It's a triumph of a film. It's magnificent. Love this movie. As a matter of fact, a little bit later today, I'm putting up a video because a bunch of you guys have asked for it on uh, me ranking my top 10 Pixar films of all time. And I'm going to be ranking them in order. And I'm not going to say where, but, but Coco did make it onto the list. Coco's in my top 10 Pixar films. And uh, that's going to be coming up a little bit later today. And I'm going to be curious to know what your top 10 of Pixar films looks like. Let me know about that. Now, you're asking the question, can it become the number one all-time Thanksgiving Day weekend box office movie? The current record held by a Hunger Games movie at $109 million. I'm going to say no. And here's why. I have been saying for a long time now that even before I saw Coco, that Coco was going to face a challenge with some parents who may look at the trailers and understandably so, nothing wrong with this. Look at the trailer and say, uh, it looks like one of the big themes about the trailers is death and loss. And some there are probably, I'm guessing, a bunch of parents out there thinking, uh, do I really want to spend Thanksgiving Day weekend taking my kid to a movie about death and loss and then having to talk to them about death and loss after the movie and blah, 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 blah. And, and I've always thought, I've been saying this for months, that that is one of the challenges that Coco is going to face as far as the box office goes. And I, even though I know how magnificent the movie is, and it's great, and believe me when I tell you, it's safe to take a kid to. It, the way it handles the subject matter is fantastic. And in, done in such a way that I really don't think you're going to have a problem with your kid. But I still think there are going to be a lot of parents out there who are looking at the marketing for it and thinking, oh, this might be a little bit too heavy for my kid, which is totally understandable. So, no, I don't think it's it has a chance of hitting that number. And some early, so not early, the last tracking numbers that came out are putting Coco somewhere between 50 and $60 million opening, which is great. I mean, that's great. That's, that's about as good as I would have thought Coco could do. The big key is going to be what kind of legs it has. Because word of mouth about this movie is going to be off the charts good. It's going to be off the charts good. I'll tell you this right now. Were the Academy Awards to be held today, I would vehemently argue, in, a, in an age where we have up to 10 pictures being nominated for Best Picture, Coco has a legitimate claim to being nominated for Best Picture. I, I'm not saying it has a claim to be Best Picture, but in an era right now, and there's still a bunch of movies to come out for 2017, granted. But if today the nominations had to come out, I would say there's a very strong case to be made that Coco should get one of those nomination spots. It's just that good. 
beautiful character, beautiful mythology, beautiful handling of a different culture, wonderful music that, again, is not music I would listen to in my car, but in the context of the movie was so feel-good and just so enrapturing. I mean, it's just, it was wonderful. And it made me want to get home and pick up my guitar and I started playing my guitar. I mean, it's just that kind of a movie. So I highly encourage you to go out and check out Coco. It's fantastic, but no, to answer the question, I do not think it has a chance of hitting that particular record for the reasons that we discussed. All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. Let's move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Nancy Brownlee, who writes, there were stories going around today that Joss Whedon was off of Batgirl, off of the Batgirl film, and another that said he was still on it. Is Batgirl still going to happen? And is Joss Whedon still going to direct it? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And of course, uh, or uh, I'm not man, Nancy, thank you so much for the question. A while ago, we heard that, this is going way back, that Joss Whedon had come on with Warner Brothers to direct a Batgirl film. Since that happened, he then got lassoed into working on Justice League. And I think given a guy who was only handed six months to do all the stuff he was asked to do in six months, I think he did a pretty damn good job. And of course, we got to keep in mind, too, that Joss Whedon is the director of the two most successful comic book movies of all time, which are uh, Avengers Age of Ultron and Avengers. I mean, those are the two most... Th that's that's not up for debate. I mean, it's, it's true. You can debate whether they're the best ones or not, but they are the most successful uh, comic book movies ever made, and he's the, been the director of both of them. And he did a pretty good job. So he's supposed to be doing Batgirl. Now... I don't like going into this type of stuff because it's not usually what I like to talk about, but it is directly connected to this issue, so I will bring it up. Of course, a short time ago, um, Joss Whedon's ex-wife put out that open letter, uh, you know, listing off all the infidelities that uh, Joss Whedon had committed while they were married. I don't remember hearing we never officially responding to them. There was nothing illegal or criminal um, that she put out in his, uh, that she put out in that open letter or anything like that. So, you know, he hasn't been out there violating laws or, or her abusing people or harassing people, but you know, he would, there was infidelities in their marriage. Okay. So Joss Whedon, one of his big things that he's really known for is the way he writes women characters and yeah, he's a self-professed feminist and things like that. And that got a lot of people chatting and buzzing is, well, you know, what kind of feminist is he if he's off cheating on his wife? I have my own opinions about that that I won't go into right now, but I believe trying to connect those two things is ridiculous, but whatever. Um, the, but there are people out there who feel that way and, and legitimately so. If that's how they feel, that's how they feel. That's fine. So I started wondering a while ago, you know what? I bet for Warner Brothers to have Joss Whedon now do a Batgirl movie, that has the potential of just dredging up a lot of this stuff again. That if he, if it gets announced that they've greenlit the movie and the movie's now moving forward, you can bet this whole thing about the letter from his ex-wife and all that kind of stuff. And there was nothing wrong with her writing that letter, by the way. But it's going to get all dredged up again and going to become the point of headlines and a lot of people are going to make a controversy out of it. And... I think Warner Brothers right now, with all the stuff they've been dealing with, that they're probably in a position where we don't want that kind of grief. But they still want to be in the Joss Whedon game. Now, I predicted about a month or two ago, when this whole thing about the open letter from his wife came out, I predicted, and I, I might be right, I might be wrong, my prediction was, we are eventually going to hear that Joss Whedon is no longer on the Batgirl film, but rather that Warner Brothers has transitioned him to another one of their properties, be it Justice League 2, be it, some, be it uh, a Green Lantern movie, be it something else, whatever. My guess was that at some point we're going to hear that they took him off Batgirl and probably cancel Batgirl altogether and hear that he's been attached to something else big and major without a female lead for now just to try to avoid that controversy. That was my guess. So what happens yesterday or the day before something like that, there was a smaller website that reported that they had an exclusive, that it, that Warner Brothers had done it, they pulled the trigger, they've taken Joss Whedon off of Batgirl. The story then continued to unfold that this modest-sized website then put on, they pulled their story down and got on Twitter and said, Warner Brothers has asked us to take the story down. Out of, so out of respect for Warner Brothers, we've taken it down. Warner Brothers is preparing a statement about this. Okay. Now, no such statement has come out from Warner Brothers since. 
after that, a number of other websites online uh, started writing out that Joss Sweden is still connected. That as far as they know, Joss Sweden is still connected to Batgirl. While that one story, and the story got around, was that Joss Sweden was no longer directing Batgirl. So you had some conflicting stuff going out there. Um, I think the key to it is this, though. If this smaller website is telling the truth, and I have no way of knowing if they are or if they aren't, but let's just let's just assume they are. <clears throat> if they are telling the truth and Warner Brothers asked them to take the story down and Warner Brothers is preparing a statement, it, there could be a scenario here, theoretically, that Warner Brothers has removed Joss and they're not ready for that to be out there yet and they're preparing a statement to announce Joss Whedon, oh, we don't, we're not going to have him do Becker, we're going to have him do this movie. It's possible that that's the scenario. It is also possible that he is still indeed attached to directing Batgirl. That's a very strong possibility. It's also possible that they may have just pulled the plug on Batgirl after the fallout of Justice League. So that's all part of the possibilities too. We just don't know at this point. So as of right now, the official word is Joss Whedon is attached to direct Batgirl. That is the official line right now. Whether or not that's still the case one week, one month, three months from now, who knows? But as of right now, that is still the uh, the official line. Is Batgirl still happening? Well, technically speaking, Batgirl has never been greenlit. They've been developing it, but that doesn't mean that it was going to go into production. So as of right now, there is no Batgirl movie, but there is one in development, and the official line is Joss Whedon is still attached to direct, so that's the best way to answer that story. We're just going to have to wait and see how this thing all unfolds. Thanks a lot for the question. All right, we move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Jackson Dunn. And Jackson Dunn writes, I read a report that said Jude Law was going to be in the new Captain Marvel film for the MCU. Is this true? And if so, would he instantly become one of the hottest actors in Hollywood considering it would be two major franchises he's in with the Harry Potter world and the MCU? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And yeah, for some of you who may not have heard, the word out there right now is that Jude Law officially is in negotiations. Marvel has given no response and has given no uh, comment on the issue right now. But that Jude Law is in negotiations to play uh, Walter something or other. I can't remember the character's name. Walter something. The Professor Walter, also known as Marvell. And I'm just actually looking it up right now. Walter Lawson is the name of the professor. Now, in, in Marvel mythology... The way it works, Marvell is this Cree. He's a he's a what they call a pink Cree, and his name is Mar hyphen Vell with two L's. All right, and he's a captain in the Cree military. Is Captain Marvell is his name, and he comes to Earth on a mission. And this Professor Lawson uh, is dead. He finds he's died in a car accident. Some incarnations of the Marvel comics have that he was actually killed by another Cree. The, Professor Lawson, that is. He was killed by another Cree. Some is he just died in a car accident, whichever one you want to go with. And Marvell takes assumes his identity. Okay, so they're saying the reports are is that Jude Law is in talks to play this character. He'd be like the male lead in it, and he would be a mentor character to Brie Larson's uh, Carol Danvers character. So that's the word. And uh, again, they said it's not official. He hasn't officially signed, and right now Marvel is making no comment on it but I think it's probably safe bet at this point he's going to be that. And if that's the case, you know what's funny? Jude Law was a guy, I remember about a year ago, me and some friends were talking about movies and things like that, and it came, Jude Law came up. It's like, man, for a while, he was like poised of being like one of the elite top five A-listers, and then he wasn't getting roles, and he just disappeared for a while, and now look at this. Now he's going to be Albus Dumbledore, in Fantastic Beasts, that's a picture of him as Albus Dumbledore in uh, Fantastic Beasts. So one of the biggest movie franchises in the world. He's going to be in the MCU. And if plans continue, they're looking at doing a third Sherlock Holmes film with him and uh, Robert Downey Jr. So it's feasible to conceive that in theaters, you could have Jude Law starring in three big major franchises all at once, which would be quite a turnaround. And you're right. I think with him appearing in these big major franchises, I think you're going to see Jude Law start to appear in a lot more stuff, which is great for us as film fans, because Jude Law is one hell of an actor. Absolutely one hell of an actor. Uh, and, uh, oh, I just noticed something, uh, 65 Drums 
did uh, did a super chat in the live chat. Thank you, 65 Drums. I really appreciate that. He said, thanks for all the great videos. I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much. That's really cool. Okay. Anyway, let's move on now to the final email question of the day. And the final email question today comes to us from Nazir M. And Nazir M writes, People are saying that Justice League is actually going to lose money. Uh, I, bunch of people online, are saying that they'll lose like $100 million. But when I checked, it said Justice League has already made almost $300 million. Didn't the movie cost $300 million? So how are they saying it's going to lose money? What am I missing? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And this actually brings up several issues that, that are common misconceptions amongst a lot of film fans and things like that. And that is this, is that when you hear about a movie's production budget, we'll start with this. When you hear about a movie's production budget, that doesn't include everything. For instance, it doesn't include the cost of marketing. There is an article, this is really the root of it all. Um, the, the magazine Forbes put out an article that basically said, Forbes magazine, I should say, put out an article that says that Justice League, if pro their projections are correct, will lose anywhere between 50 and $100 million. And Warner Brothers is actually going to lose money on Justice League. That's where all this comes from. So a couple of things they put out there is that their understanding is that the movie did cost about $300 million when all the reshoots and everything was taken into consideration. So about $300 million. On top of that, you had about $150 million in marketing. So now you're looking at a price tag of $450 million. Now, then you might think, well, does it only need to make $450 to break even then? No, because what you have to then do is you have to take into consideration the cut, pardon me, that the movie theaters take. Which for the, look, it's not an exact science, but just the best way to just get a general idea is take the total box office and take one third off of it. All right. So let's say Justice League now costs $450 million, 300 for production budget, 150 for marketing budget. So $450 million. Let's say Justice League makes 600 million at the box office. Well, take off about one third. In this case, that would be about 200 million. So now you've got 400 million that it's made versus 450 million that it costs. That's a $50 million loss for Warner Brothers. Now, I don't think Justice League is only going to make $600 million. I think Justice League is going to go north of $600 million. It's clearly not going to hit the billion dollar club. That much is obvious. But I think it will do more than $600 million. I believe Justice League, when it's all said and done, will at least break even for uh from warner brothers in dc which is a far cry from it joining the billion dollar club like i have been saying it would for a long time and hey look at that who knew uh it, that came up way short but i don't think they're going to actually eventually lose money i think they'll do better than that now here's the funny let me talk about this for a second okay because i've been seeing this going all over and it's just crazy there are a bunch of people um promoting this this theory going around online right now that Justice League is making a big comeback. It's surging at the box office. It's like, what? wait, what? What are you talking about? And their big thing is this, is that it set some kind of record for the biggest, here, follow me here, for the biggest increase at the box office from its first Monday to its first Tuesday. It made like a 40% increase from Monday to Tuesday. That's kind of like saying that guy made the most number one hits out of any musical artist with three Qs and a silent W in their name. I mean, you're really stretching to find something positive to say there. But the big thing going around online right now is that Justice League is surging back. Okay, here's the reality. On Monday... Justice League made in the neighborhood of seven hundred or of seven million dollars on Monday. On Tuesday, it made like ten point five million dollars, which was like a forty percent increase. Which was, I, I can't confirm that this is a record, but the, they're saying it's a record of the highest jump from the first Monday to the first Tuesday, as if this is some big unique thing. But let's put this in context, though. Let's just look at Thor Ragnarok. Thor Ragnarok also made a jump from Monday to Tuesday. More people go to the movies on Tuesday than go to the movies on Monday. On Monday, on Thor Ragnarok's first Monday, it made like $8 million. 
And on its first Tuesday, it made $10.8 million. So it also had like a 32, 33% jump, not 40% jump, but it made more money on its Monday and it made more money on its Tuesday than Justice League did. So while sure, yeah, Justice League making 10.5 on a Tuesday, which was up from its previous day on Monday, is a good thing, but that's not an uncommon phenomenon. I mean, just Thor Ragnarok, we saw it do the same thing. So, I don't get too excited about that. I mean, that's great that it didn't go down, but don't get too excited about this thing. Did you see that Justice League surged on Tuesday? Well, th that's kind of the... Movies make more money on Tuesday than Mondays. It's not a terribly big thing to get excited about. So, no, no, do not expect some big surge from Justice League. Some people saying that Justice League, this is proof that Justice League is only going to take like a 25 or 30% drop on its second weekend from its first weekend. And I think, uh, okay, that's okay. That's cool if you think that. Um, I'll be shocked, shocked if Justice League takes anything less than a 60% drop. I'll be happy, shocked, because I like the movie. I mean, I, I'm one of the few people who really like it. But I, I'm going to be very, very surprised if it makes less than a 60% drop on its second weekend, especially with Coco opening. Because remember, on its opening weekend, all it had to deal with was like Thor Ragnarok on its third weekend. And uh, this other movie, uh, what was it? Wonderful. Wonder, Wonder. That movie Wonder, which made $27 million. That was the number two movie, was Wonder, made $27 million. So really, there wasn't very much stiff competition for the box office dollar and Justice League still made under $100 million. What do we expect to happen when Coco comes out and Coco's being projected to gobble up 50 to $60 million? You really think Justice League is going to come in higher than Coco? I, I don't think so. I could be wrong. I mean, it, it's, it, it is possible. We have seen Stranger Things. I'm not saying it's impossible. Not at all. But I'm just saying it. I would question your sanity if you put money on that. But who knows? We'll just have to wait and see what happens. Maybe some magic can happen and we'll see some cool things. All right. With that out of the way now, guys, I said I was going to save some time near the end of the show to take your live questions for those of you who are watching live, and I'm going to do that right now. Here's how you get a, a comment, question, or opinion on live right now. Simply jump on Twitter and tweet to me at John Campia. Just tweet to me at John Campia, and I will get to as many live questions as I can, and maybe you'll see your tweet pop up here on the bottom of my screen. But before we get to that, it's time for my daily little commercial break where I shamelessly plug the only thing that keeps this channel alive and keep makes these shows possible which is of course my patreon campaign check this out we'll be back in one minute for those of you who have followed me for any period of time, you guys know that I made the decision recently to leave the corporate overlords. I no longer wanted to work for corporations. I wanted to be an independent content creator. And the only way I've been able to do that is by the support of my Patreon supporters. So what I would like to do is to ask you guys who watch my shows, who spend any amount of time with me every single month, to consider going over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. There you'll get all the information about what exactly does it mean to be a Patreon supporter of mine? What does being a Patreon supporter do for helping to make sure that shows like this one and all the other shows I do here on my channel can actually be produced? And on top of that, what benefits are there to being a Patreon supporter? And maybe if you guys can check that out, if you decide you want to be one of my Patreon supporters, that would be awesome. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine too. I'm just happy that you guys have decided to be here today and be a fellow movie fan and join us in the conversation. So go and check out the website, see if you want to become a Patreon supporter. And now let's get back. All right, and we're back. Thank you again. A special thank you to all of you guys who are already Patreon supporters. You do make what I do here possible. Thank you so much. You have no idea how grateful I am on this American Thanksgiving. Okay, with all that stuff out of the way now, I'm gonna open up my Twitter board and we've already got a whole ton of tweets in here ready to go. Remember guys, keep your tweets as short as possible if you can. Let's check this out. The first question today comes to us from I am Zarir Uden who writes, news is fans don't want Johnny Depp in Fantastic Beast movie. Why is, uh, why is that? Why people don't like him? He's a great actor. Uh, look, it's the same as any casting in any movie. You cast somebody in a movie, especially one that's a pre-existing property. People are going to be very passionate about who gets cast in what roles. Fact of the matter is, Johnny Depp is a great actor. 
And we've seen that in his career. Unfortunately, a lot of people today just associate Johnny Depp with the clown characters he plays. You know, whether it's in, you know, Alice in Wonderland or whether it's in as Captain Jack Sparrow or whether it's as this goofy character or that goofy character, or whatever. <clears throat> but beneath all that, he is a great, he's an Academy Award nominated actor. But there are going to be people that don't like the casting. And they won't like the casting no matter who was cast in the role. So they don't like the casting and they want to get up and vocal about it. And that's fine. I, I mean, that's cool. You're just gonna have to wait and see. I remember how much nobody wanted Hugh Jackman as Wolverine and nobody wanted Heath Ledger as Joker. But the one thing that all those situations have in common is that they overlook the one main thing. They're, they were all very talented actors. Like, okay, yes, uh, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. <sighs> You know, Wolverine's supposed to be five foot three or five foot one or something like that. He's supposed to be super short. Jackman's like over six feet tall. This will never work. Okay, but the most important thing here is he's a celebrated actor. He's known as this great stage actor, which is some of the hardest type of acting to do, which is why I love the Ray Fisher casting as Cyborg because he came from Broadway. And they were overlooking the fact that, look, beneath all that, whatever other issues you want to look at, he, that guy is a great actor. And that's the most important thing. So he came in to play Wolverine. And now it's hard for us, for any of us, to imagine him not being Wolverine. Heath Ledger. Well, he's that guy from Brokeback Mountain. Okay, homophobe, whatever. But you're looking past the point that this dude has turned in some incredible performances. He is, when he's on his A-game. Now, he, Heath Ledger was a little hit and miss as an actor. He was. But when Heath Ledger was on his A-game, he was a great actor. And that's what Christopher Nolan saw, that this dude is a great actor. So people just need to look past all the other superfluous stuff. Superfluous? I just made up a word. He just They just had to look through all that other stuff and just look at the fact that this is a very talented actor. And I think the same principle needs to apply with Johnny Depp here. Get past all the other stuff and just go back to its core. Is Johnny Depp a great actor? The answer is yes. He is. He doesn't show it off a lot because of the types of roles he normally takes, but he's a great actor. So I think the people in the Harry Potter fan community need to get over it. <clears throat> Just embrace it. He is a really good actor. Let's see what the director does with him and then move forward from there. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot for the tweet, man. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, this one comes to us from uh, Dakian Pridden, who writes, John, will we ever hear you playing guitar on the channel? I played my guitar once on an episode of Mailbag uh, because I lost a bet. Uh, regard uh, over a football game I lost a bet and uh, I thought I was going to get mocked and ridiculed for it but you guys were very kind to me when I did that you were very kind I don't know maybe I'll pull out the guitar and play it again on the show who knows let's see uh, this next question comes to us from Kevin Wright 7 who writes John which is better ooh Moana or Coco oi damn they're oh god I love both of these movies these movies are so good um, I love Moana. I love Coco. They're very different movies from each other. They're both fantastic. My goodness. If I, oh, I, I can't answer. I, I don't know. That's a horrible thing to say. John, do you want to cut off your left foot or your right foot? Ah, uh, I, uh, I'm stumped. You've completely stumped me. I can't give an answer to that. I'm totally stumped. All right, next one comes to us from Jay Dolan 74 who writes, John, a 60% drop for Justice League would have it making $37 million. Do you really see it dropping that low? Absolutely, I do. Uh, I absolutely see it potentially dropping that low. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not predicting 60%. I'm just saying I won't be surprised at all for it to be 60 I will be shocked if it gets less than that. Um, like, if it, if it gets anywhere... Here's the thing. I think fans of the movie should be happy if it drops between 50 and 60 if it drops in between 50 and 60, I think we should be happy with that because the response hasn't been great. It's Coco is opening up. It does have something going for it in that it's a holiday weekend. And maybe a lot of people are going to be going out to the movie theaters this weekend. That's totally possible. So maybe we could see, you know, Justice League making 45 million, maybe 48 million, something like that. I'll be surprised. I'll be surprised. But I, I do think that 40 million 38 million, 37 million. I, th I think a result like that is within the realm of possibility for this next weekend. But who knows? I mean, hey, let's see. Let's see what happens. All right, let's see. Uh, this next one comes to us from A. Hakulian writes, worst and best moment in the Star Wars saga. Uh, worst 
Anything to do with Jar Jar Binks. Best, the, th the Emperor's Throne Room lightsaber battle scene between Luke and Vader is the single greatest scene ever in cinematic history, in my opinion. Uh, all right. Let's see. This one comes to us from Loco for Coco, who writes, John, I've never seen a movie audience cry like they did with Coco. Could this be Pixar's most poignant movie yet? It, it's going to be up for debate. Like I said, a little bit later today, I have my video coming out on my top 10 um, Pixar movies of all time. I'll tell you right now, Coco is not in the number one spot. I'll tell you that right now. So, but it's definitely going to be up for debate. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people because Coco is a very special movie. There's going to be a lot of people that Coco will become their favorite Pixar movie ever. I think for some people are going to look at Coco and think it's their favorite animated movie ever of all time, period, and stop. So it's a very special movie. We'll just have to see how the, the crowd reacts to it. All right, this next one comes to us from Sev Fernando, who writes, John, it sucks that Ben will no longer be Batman, but a Batman or DC movie directed by him would be awesome. Thoughts? Well, I've been saying that forever. He was supposed to direct the next Batman. Warner Brothers and the DCU had it made. All right, they had it made. They had Ben Affleck, a lifelong Batman fan, one of the hottest and best directors in Hollywood today, one of the best filmmakers in the business right now. And he's, I mean, he just starred in the movie that won Best Picture at the Academy Awards. He's a, he's a fine actor, all that kind of stuff. And they had him locked in. What they should have done immediately was made Ben Affleck the Kevin Feige of their cinematic universe. One of the best filmmakers in the world today, whose film just won Best Picture at the Academy Awards, by the way, that he starred in and directed. You had that guy on board who has a deep passion that he even built a bat cave at his own home, who's got a passionate understanding of the comic book material, but more importantly, he has an understanding of the filmmaking art and filmmaking business, something Jeff Johns does not have. So you had that. They should have instantly lifelong contract. Ben Affleck, you are Kevin Feige. You can write and direct whichever one of the properties you want, and you are going to be the godfathering shepherd of our DCEU. Go. That's what they should have done. That's what they should have done. And instead, now we've got the situation we're in, which is a, a terrible mess. And I'm not saying none of that is Ben Affleck's fault. I'm not saying that at all. Ben Affleck bears some responsibility here. So does uh, Warner Brothers. So I'm not I'm not just sitting here trying to put all the blame on Warner Brothers. I know it sounds like that. Forgive me. That's not my intention. Um, but, I mean, really what they should have done immediately is not just announced him as Batman. They should have announced him as Batman and overseen Godfather of the whole DCEU. In my opinion, that's what they should have done. Put a true filmmaker at the head of that whole thing and let him run with it? Money. Total money. That's just my opinion. I'm sure a lot of you disagree with me. That's awesome. Disagreement is what it's all about for being a film fan. All right. Next one comes to us from uh, Majin Goku Black who writes, John, remember that Kevin Bacon drama, The Following? What happened to it? What about Kevin Bacon? Well, yeah, I actually liked The Following. The first season I thought was great. The second season, it started to peter off. What, like, really, because the main antagonist, which was the main premise for the show as a whole, you know, once you get to the end of season one and they kind of resolve their protagonist, their antagonist, I should say, sort of, at the end of season one, then the show started to peter off and it started to lose viewers and ultimately it got canceled. So I wasn't surprised, but it's a really good first season. I enjoyed the first season quite a bit. Yesterday, I was kind of, uh, encouraging you guys to go and binge watch the only season of that show Awake starring Jason Isaacs. The next one I would say is go and binge watch just season one of the following. It's It was actually quite a good show. At least the first season was. I highly It's worth a binge. It really is. It's worth a binge. All right. I still got some time here. Let's go next. Um, this one comes to us from Nathan Vandor who writes, John, Shrek 2 or Cars? Oh, Shrek 2. Easy. No questions asked. Um, this this one. Elijah A.U. writes, uh, John, would you rather Scorsese or Ben Affleck for Batman, as in directing Batman? Hey, all due respect to the great Martin Scorsese, Ben Affleck is the one with the deep passion for Batman. I would love a Martin Scorsese-directed Batman, but I'll, I'll take a Ben Affleck-directed Batman, to be honest. This is one of those rare situations that you could give me where I would actually pick Ben Affleck to direct over Martin Scorsese, but this is one of those situations that I would. Uh, let's see. John, is it possible to reboot Justice League but still keep uh, Gal Gadot and Henry Cavill? Well, you know my opinion on Gal Gadot. I, 
she's done okay as Wonder Woman, but the strength of Wonder Woman has been in the directing and in the dialogue that they've given her. I, I still don't believe, as much as everybody loves it, and that's fine, you keep your opinion, I it's not my job to say the popular thing. Gal Gadot's not that good of an actress, so I'm more than fine with them uh, replacing her uh, as an actress, although that would be a problem. Even I, even me, um, who I still look, just watch every other Gal Gadot movie. She, she's not a good actress. She does not elevate the material and she develops all of her dialogue like wooden sticks. But anyway, but even I who say all of that, if I was one of the executives of Warner Brothers, even I right now would be saying, you got to try to find a way to keep her. I don't think you have to keep her if you reboot, but you at least have, even I would say, you have to explore a way to keep her because right now to the audience, she is Wonder Woman. She's She's been Wonder Woman for the first two movies that the characters appeared in. She is Wonder Woman to a lot of them. And you at least have to try to find a way to keep her. And that's coming from me for heaven's sakes. So if I'm saying that, um, you know that's probably what Warner Brothers needs to be thinking. They got to try to find a way. But look, to me, no matter how much I love Henry Cavill as Superman, and you all know I love Henry Cavill as Superman, no matter how much I love Ben Affleck as Batman, no matter whatever, if Warner Brothers reboots, then you reboot. That comes first. The story comes first. And if you reboot, then you don't dick around. You reboot and you start fresh. And that means all new characters. Even as much as I loved Henry Cavill, even as much as I've loved Ben Affleck, even as much as I've loved a number of the characters, actors who've played their roles, the fact of the matter is there are other great actors out there. There are. There are other great actors out there who can come in and do just as good of a job or as close to as good of a job or maybe even better job than the actors who are there now. We've seen it happen before. And they just rebooted Spider-Man, for heaven's sakes. Worked great. They rebooted Hulk a couple of times. Worked great. I mean, it, it's fine. They can do it. So, But even I would say you have to at least see if you can find a way, if there's a way to keep on the existing cast. But anyway, it, that's a big issue for another time. Uh, let's see. This next one. Andrew Nosala45 writes, John, what other animated films other than Coco have a shot at being nominated for Best Animated Picture this year? Well, there's really been nothing all that good. I mean, you've had the Lego Batman movie was quite good. I enjoyed that a hell of a lot. Those are the only two I can really think of that even deserve to be talked about as far as best animated picture goes, unless I'm forgetting something significant. But, you know, a lot of the animated films this year have been cracked. Even Despicable Me 3, and I'm a fan of the Despicable Me franchise. I was really disappointed in Despicable Me 3. I thought that thing was a load of crap. Not a strong year for animated film, my friends. Not a strong year. Uh, let's see. This one comes to us from NG Sibiri Bryce 90 writes, John, can we see an improvement on Justice League when the extended version comes out just like BVS? Well, look, whether BVS, the extended version, even was an improvement is up for debate. Because, look, that, that movie is still far too long. That was a three-plus-hour movie, the extended cut. Far too long. It still had all the weaknesses that BVS did. It just had it added in a couple of cool things. But it didn't erase a lot of the bad stuff about it. And that's the problem with it. And no, I don't expect that Warner Brothers, there will not be an extended cut. I, I'm going to be surprised. I can't say it's impossible because absolutely it's possible. But I'll be surprised if Warner Brothers does an extended cut or a director's cut per se. I don't think they're going to do that. I think they got out of that business. Uh, let's see. Uh, this next one, I'll take just a couple more here. This one comes to us from S F. Saul Joy, who writes, John, what's Robert Downey Jr.'s future after the MCU? Hey, he's got his own production company now. He's a producer on a lot of things. He's still a hot name. Uh, whenever he's done with the MCU, and I don't think he's going to be done with the MCU for a while, he'll be fine. He's Robert Downey Jr. He'll be fine. And the final question I'm taking today comes to us from, again, Elijah, who writes, John, would it be better to cast an unknown that looks like Batman for the Batman movie? I, I don't care. I don't care. It's not best to get an unknown. It's not best to get unknown. It's best to get a great actor. Whether the actor is unknown or famous is irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. Just get a really great actor. Get a good actor and plug them in and everything else will work itself out. Just like it did for Hugh Jackman, who looked nothing like what Wolverine is supposed to look like. They make up him up. Yeah, his height. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. But Hugh Jackman's a great actor. That takes care of a lot of problems. 
You put in a great actor in the role, that solves all the other issues. It really does. If they do a good job with the role. And that's not really all that matters. So whether it's a known actor, whether... Look, am I open to an unknown actor? Sure. Like Ray Fisher is an unknown actor, but he's a great actor. Coming from a Broadway background, touted by casting agents all over the place as a can't-miss guy. Henry Cavill was the same thing. Henry Cavill was a name that most people hadn't heard of, but the stuff he had done, he had shown he's an exceptional actor. Casting agents all around Hollywood were, were touting this guy as a cannot-miss superstar for a long time because of his talent, and so they got him. So I'm fine with them getting an unknown as long as it's an A-chip, blue-chip, you know, solid-listed guy that they're looking for. As long as it's somebody who brings a buttload of talent to the table, that's all that matters. That's all that matters, and everything else will be fine. So if they get an unknown who's super talented, like they did with Ray Fisher, great. Like they did with Henry Cavill, great. If it's a well-known actor that they want to bring to the table, like they did with Ben Affleck, great. Like they did with J.K. Simmons playing Commissioner Gordon, great. That's fine. All that I care about is, it is, a, is it a great actor? And that's the only thing that matters because that'll solve all the other problems that come along. All right, guys, that will do it for this installment of the John Campy Show. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you to all you guys who, of course, are my Patreon supporters. And also, guys, while you're here, click the thumbs up button. As of the beginning of this episode, I was just 613 subscribers away from hitting 100,000 subscribers, something I thought would take me almost another year to get to. And yet here we are. We're 613 subscribers away. So if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, take a second, click the subscription button, become one of my subscribers. Remember, guys, jump into the comments section, carry on the discussions. But remember, we're all film fans here together. We have drastically different opinions about movies, but that's the fun thing. We don't want to discourage us from having different opinions from each other. We want to engage with each other and debate and have some fun. But just remember, we're all on the same team. So let's not get into the name calling and stupid stuff like this. Let's just have some fun debating our favorite things, which is movies. All right, guys, that will do it for me for today. Thanks so much for joining me. My name is John Campia. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Have a safe, fun time with friends and family, and be safe in your travels if you're traveling today like I am a little bit later. That'll do it. My name is John Campia, and until the next video, bye-bye.